Does fasting really double our risk of heart problems? This is Liz our Wellbeing, and yep, I am dusting off my soapbox yet again. This one really is a doozy. Now you may have seen the headlines recently linking fasting to a higher risk of death due to cardiovascular disease. Naturally, my ears pricked up at this news. I've long been an advocate of fasting. Daily, I aim to stick to the 16-8 plan, where you only eat for an eight hour window. But I've also been a fan of doing longer fasts, for example, 10 days, 12 days at the Booking at Willoughby clinics, and felt so much better for it. So, when news of this new study started flying around, I thought, you know, I need to take a look at this. I pride myself on living an evidence-based lifestyle and sharing that information with you guys. Buckle up, because this is a wild ride. Where did all this come from? Well, it's from a team of Chinese researchers who were presenting their early findings of a study looking into people that limit their eating window to less than eight hours a day. What they found and what was largely reported in the media was that people who limited their eating window to less than eight hours a day, i.e. me, those who intermittent fast, had an increased risk of dying from heart and circulatory diseases. Scary, right? Well, don't believe everything you read. In fact, don't believe a word of it. The media reporting and the actual science behind this are nothing short of a scandal, if you ask me. So where do we begin unravelling all of this? Well, let's start with the data set itself. The data that the scientists used is based on a nutrition survey of around 20,000 people living in America. Now, this is important. This survey was self-reported and it basically asked the respondent to state what they'd eaten in the last 24 hours. So a few problems here already. Number one, how many people can accurately and honestly recount every small bite of what they had to eat the day before? It's all too easy to miss out the slice of cheese, or three if you're like me, grazed on while making dinner. So you can see how inaccuracies already might start to arise when you have self-reporting. So number two, we don't know anything about that day for that person or their typical lifestyle. Were they on holiday? Was it a weekend? Were they at the office? Was it out of the ordinary for them? Is it summer? Is it winter? Are they hot? Are they cold? Had they been out of a new eating regime recently? Were they undergoing treatment? This is an important one, of course. Treatment for an existing medical issue? Hmm. No one knows. You know, so many factors can make such a big impact for our well-being. Just think about this for yourself. I know what I ate in the last 24 hours is hardly actually indicative of my usual long-term patterns. In fact, right now, I'm with my family in Italy for an Easter break, indulging in, yeah, absolutely, way more pasta and cheese than I would normally eat, even a bit of ice cream, much more red wine. You know, but I'm not plugging it into a data set that could potentially influence future health policy. And as if all that wasn't bad enough, this so-called new research is using data that's 20 years old. The surveys were taken between 2003 to 2004 and 2005 to 2006. Just think how much health and nutrition has moved on since then. If you ask me, it truly is so irrelevant to the average person today that we should just completely disregard this information as utter nonsense. It's important to consider the basic design of this study too. You know, the gold standard for science is a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. And this is definitely not that. It's an observational study. And let's be honest, not a very good one, to put it mildly. Now, observational studies are where a trend has been identified by two different factors. It doesn't imply any causation. So, for example, observationally, you could say that those who bought a handbag also like kittens. But liking kittens doesn't cause you to buy a handbag. Now, the brilliant Zoe Harkin, who I've recorded several podcasts with actually in the past, has done a fantastic analysis of this study. And she also has a truly excellent newsletter that you can sign up for if you're interested in this kind of thing. She really studies the data to point out fact from fiction and call out 
well, just bad science, really. And I'll make sure that we put a link to her website below. But I just wanted to share her conclusion on this study here. So Zoe writes here, and I quote, the poster, that's from the researchers, concluded by saying, these findings require replication, but do not support long-term use of eight-hour time-restricted eating for the prevention of cardiovascular death, nor for improving longevity. And that is nonsense. Nothing was found for all causes mortality so longevity can't even be mentioned. The claims for CVD deaths were based on 31 events in over 20,000 people and groups and eating windows were so uneven that bias must be suspected. And all of this relates to two attempts to remember what was eaten yesterday 20 years ago. This has no relevance to people today who choose not to eat all day long. So there we have it, strong words indeed. Now, this study is yet to be peer reviewed and published. And if it does make it through peer review, which I very much doubt because it's such nonsense, well, let's say that many eyebrows, including mine and Zoe's, will most definitely be raised. You know, I can't help but wonder sometimes if there is an agenda behind all of this. More of us are skipping breakfast in favour of intermittent fasting and finding that it really benefits our health and well-being, especially in midlife. But while we might be benefiting from that, breakfast companies are certainly not benefiting. Food for thought, perhaps, as to who might be promoting this. Well, what I know is that fasting has transformed my body, my energy, my sleep, the list goes on. And there have been previous and far stronger, more accurate studies that really highlight the benefits of fasting for so many areas of our health. I talk about this all the more in my upcoming book, A Better Second Half, where I really dive into the nitty gritty of what the real science says about various areas of diet and nutrition. I will include a link below if you'd like to pre-order to find out more. I would love to know what you think. Has this enraged you? Did you fall for this nonsense? Let me know your thoughts. Do drop me a comment. Always love to hear your views on here especially. So until the next time we chat again, go well.